Romans chapter 15. And look at verse number 4. It says, For whatsoever things were written afore time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. But I want us to look at that. For what sort of things are written before time were written for our learning. And tonight, I want to take us, or for the next year, <laughs> uh, I, cannot, I can't take us verse by verse. It would take two, possibly three years to go verse by verse because the book of John is absolutely so rich. Uh, and there's a lot to be said and a lot to, to be covered. So I want to cover certain portions of it, um, and I'm going to describe it a little bit tonight as I go through the book of John. But tonight, I kind of just want to give you guys an overview, if you want an intro uh, to the book of John. So there's going to be a lot of lists. Um, I'm going to list some things for you, things that are, are listed and bulleted in, in the book of John. Uh, and I want to give those to you, and if it bores you, I'm sorry, get the recording, and listen to it again, write them down. Uh, but I, I, feel, I really feel like in order to do this book justice, in order to give you what uh, the Lord, what the Holy Spirit is trying to say in this book, I, I really feel like I need to say the things that are going to be said tonight. Uh, but the Bible, say man, if you agree with this statement, the Bible is a wonderful book. Is it not? It's a wonderful book. It, it is a life-changing book. There is no doubt in my, in my mind uh, that this book and the things written in this book about the Lord Jesus Christ changed my life uh, and, and shaped me and has fashioned me into the man I am today. Uh, but the Gospels in particular are very important. Now, I kind of want to, the way I want to kind of do this tonight uh, in preparation for the book of John is I want to kind of take a running start and, and uh, go from Matthew to John. Just briefly, I'm not going to preach all of Matthew and all of Mark and all of Luke and all of John. I kind of just want to kind of get a running start uh, and get into the book of John. But the Gospels are considered Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John. I know that seems elementary, it seems basic, but you'd be surprised at how many people do not know that. Um, but if we did not have the Gospels, uh, we would not truly know or understand who the Lord Jesus Christ actually is. You have to have the Gospels in order to know who Jesus is. Um, and... Uh, there are many similarities in the Gospels, and I'm sure you may be familiar with some of this, but here are a few. Each Gospel records the ministry of John the Baptist. Uh, each Gospel records the feeding of the 5,000. Each Gospel records the Last Supper and betrayal of Judas. Uh, each Gospel records Simon Peter's denial, and each Gospel records the passion of Christ, including his arrest, uh, his uh, trial, and his crucifixion. Each gospel records the Lord's resurrection and post-resurrection, for that matter, in his ministry. Uh, and each gospel points forward to the second advent uh, of Jesus Christ. So the gospels are also different. Although they are the same, um, they are different in many ways. Each gospel has distinctive uh, theme that, uh, that's taken together to provide a, a full view, if you will. They all have different angles uh, uh, from the life of Christ. And listen, the Lord never intended for us to have just a single gospel account uh, or even just two gospel accounts. Uh, God, in God's wisdom, uh, He gave us four accounts giving us a full picture uh, of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, tonight, you need all four gospels in order to see a clear picture of who uh, your Savior is, Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew, uh, so starting with Matthew, Matthew is a Jewish book. Uh, Matthew portrays Christ as king of the Jews. That's how Matthew portrays Christ as king of the Jews. Uh, his intended audience was a Jewish audience. Uh, in Matthew 1, he traces the Lord's uh, uh, genealogy through Abraham to establish his uh, credentials as the king of the Jews. And if you know your Bible, uh, the Jewish... Uh, genealogy started with Abraham. So Matthew starts out with tracing Jesus Christ's genealogy back to Matthew chapter 1. Um, also, uh, Matthew 3, 2, you can see John the Baptist preaching and saying, Repent ye, uh, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, it is interesting to note also that the ascension of Jesus Christ is not recorded in Matthew. Uh, and why is that? Maybe you've often wondered that. Because the king's rightful place is here on earth. Uh, so that's why it doesn't give any kind of distinction uh, in his ascension. Uh, Mark is intended, in its intended audience uh, for this 
for this audience is the Romans. So that is more toward a Roman audience. And Mark portrays Jesus Christ as the servant uh, of the Lord. Uh, it, interestingly enough, Mark includes no genealogies because guess what? The genealogy of a servant is unimportant. Uh, so Mark portrays John the Baptist as a preacher declaring repentance. And you can see that in Mark 1.4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And then in Mark, Christ ascends to continue his work among the apostles. And then you have the book of Luke. Uh, Luke intended his audience to be of the Greeks. Uh, Luke portrays Jesus as the Son of Man. So you have Jesus and Matthew as uh, King of the Jews. Then you have in Mark, Jesus Christ portrayed as the servant. And then you have in Luke, Jesus Christ uh, portrayed as the Son of Man. Uh, and in Luke, the Lord is carried into heaven, seen in his humanity, making use of, a div of his divine help. Uh, and then, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known to some as the synoptic gospels. Now, sin meaning... Uh, same, optic meaning view, synoptic uh, view. The synoptic theory is the view that Matthew, Mark, Luke uh, all originate uh, from a single author. And uh, you won't find any evidence of this in the Bible, however. Uh, the reason that uh, many people think this is is because the Gospel of John is, is so unique uh, in its style and scope. And there are some obvious distinctions that can be made between the first three Gospels and the Gospel of John. So, uh, I'm going to give you some of those distinctions tonight. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, only one Passover is mentioned. In John, uh, you, have, you have three to four Passovers mentioned. Uh, the geography is different as well. Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke are more centered in Galilee, whereas John is more centered, uh, concentrated uh, in Judea. And the ministry, of, uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ is different as well. Matthew, Mark, and Luke... Uh, focus more upon his work, uh, what he did, what Jesus Christ did. Whereas in John, it focuses more on his words, what Jesus Christ says. Uh, and then in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus spoke in parables in a public, in a public place. Oftentimes, that's where he spoke parables. Whereas in John, you have a record of one parable, uh, and it is more of a private audience. Uh, so there are some distinctions. Also, too, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the general perspective is historical. Whereas in the book of John, the general perspective is more doctrinal. And we can see that. If you, we're going we're to see that as we go through the book of John, that it's more of a doctrinal book rather than a historical book. Uh, so John, if I haven't set it up for you tonight, John is a very, very, very unique book. Um, set right there in the beginning of the New Testament is uh, some wonderful truth. So the book of John. Uh, let's take a deeper look at this book. Uh, John has 21 chapters, 879 verses, and 19,094 words. I went through there and counted every single one. I'm just kidding, I didn't. Um, but it was written by the Apostle John, and the Apostle John was, uh, he was referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved throughout the gospel. Now, he never comes out and says that I was the one that Jesus loved the most uh, because John was humble. He was a humble guy. Uh, but the Gospel of John was written around AD 90, and it was written from the Isle of Patmos around the same time that John wrote his other, uh, his other epistles, his other writings. And the purpose of this book, let's, tonight, the purpose of this book, the purpose of the book of John is laid out plainly in John chapter 20. So if you would, turn over to John chapter 20, and we will look at uh, what, the, what the purpose of this book is. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And look at verse 30 and 31. It says, And many other signs truly did uh, Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So... Uh, that is the purpose of this book, uh, is to show forth the glory of God, to show forth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing that we might have life through His name. So uh, uh, John's intended audience for this gospel, as we said, the first was to the Jews, uh, the other ones uh, to the Romans, to the Greeks, to, to the Gentile. Uh, and, and John is, this passage here, uh, John is intended this audience 
his intended audience would be the world. So even though it is written to the world, it is particularly of a, of a Gentile readership if you read through the book of John. So number one, I want to point out tonight the theme of the Gospel of John. The theme. Uh, I kind of, like I said, I really feel like I got to go through this in order to set us, uh, set us up uh, for what we are to, to undertake the rest of this year as we go through the book of John. Um, so please turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. If you're there, forgive me. John chapter 1. All the way throughout the book of John, it declares the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ as God manifests in the flesh. It drips off the page with every, with every turn of the page. It drips off the page. It just screams the deity of Jesus Christ. And so this truth is set forth in every chapter of John. Every turning of the page, it, it, it screams it. But let's look at John chapter 1 verse 1. It says... In the beginning was the Word. Now, we're going to get into this next week. I'm going to be talking about the Word and uh, the light here. But uh, for tonight, I kind of want to give us some food for thought here. Uh, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, right out of the gate, showing forth His equality with God, with the Creator of this universe. Now, back in those days, that might have been a slap in the face to those Pharisees uh, for somebody to compare themselves to Almighty God. And here this guy comes along and he's professing to be God. And so notice that John doesn't start with a long list of genealogies like the other Gospels. Uh, right out of the gate he says, In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Look at John 1.3. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. So John shows Christ as the creator of all things, putting himself in the book of Genesis. So if you would, turn over to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. What a thing to do. Put yourself in the creation. That's what it says. In the beginning. That's the only other terminology that there is. Is Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning. Same terminology. So he puts them back in the, back in the garden here. Genesis chapter 3. And verse number 8. He says, And they heard the voice of of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam, his wife, uh, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now, I find that fascinating. And the reason I find that fascinating is, is because how does a voice walk? How does a voice walk? In my opinion, I believe that might just have been the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word. Capital W. He is the mouthpiece of God. He is the Word of God. So how does a voice walk? I believe that, it, my, me personally, my, my understanding of it, I believe that that was Jesus Christ in the garden walking in the cool of the day. So turn back to John chapter 1 again. John chapter 1. And we're going to get more into that. I'll probably reference that again next week. But John chapter 1, verse 18, it says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Uh, here Christ is described as the only begotten of the Father, in the bosom of the Father. Uh, John 1.49, Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And Nathan, Nathanael declares Him to be the Son of God. Here, uh, again, and, and then also in John chapter 2, verse 11, in the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth His glory, and His disciples believed on Him. So here He is showing forth His glory. And let me just say, while we are on the first miracle of our Lord, that the division of this book are outlined by the miracles that Jesus performed. And that, that's, how the, that's how the book of John is divided. Of all those great wonders wrought by Jesus, the Holy Spirit led John, uh, He led John to record seven Seven miracles. And the seven miracles serve not just individually, but they are, uh, they are, they are a sequence uh, to emphasize his deity. That's the whole purpose of everything that happens in John tonight. Listen, everything that happens in John is to show forth his deity. Uh, and that's what, it, that's what, it's, that's what it's about. Uh, so, Jesus turned the water into wine. You can find the miracles in John chapter 2. Uh, that shows that salvation comes by the Word of God. The illustration is that when man's provision fails, Jesus can and will provide that which is far better. 
And if you're saved tonight, you can understand that, that Jesus Christ has given you something far better than you can ever get from this world. Uh, the second miracle of the book of John is the healing of the nobleman's son. And you can find this miracle in John chapter 4. And this miracle shows that salvation is by faith, which we all understand. And listen, we're going to get deeper into these miracles. We're going to take uh, one miracle a week and uh, break it down and dig a little deeper into it. But the third miracle is the healing of the paralytic, uh, paralytic man in John chapter 6. And this shows that salvation is by grace. The fourth miracle, the fourth miracle right here is the turning point, uh, standing between the first uh, three and the last three. Uh, the fourth miracle is the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6. And this shows that Jesus uses human means uh, to bring the miracle of salvation to the lost uh, men of this world. That's what it's for. That's what that uh, miracle was to represent. Uh, so it's right there in the middle. And his using men to carry the bread to the multitude pictures God using the foolishness of preaching to carry the bread of life uh, to the spiritually hungry. Uh, and then so you have the last three miracles show the results of salvation in the believer. And the fifth miracle is the calming of the storm. If you remember, uh, such a tremendous miracle. This shows that salvation brings peace. And uh, if there was ever th something that brought peace, it sure was salvation. I know it did for me. Uh, but the, sixth the sixth miracle is the healing of the blind man in chapter 9. And this shows that salvation brings light. Salvation brings light. The seventh miracle is the raising of Lazarus. And we'll probably spend a couple, uh, couple lessons in chapter 11 dealing with the miracle of the raising of Lazarus. And also uh, with, uh, also with the, him claiming to be, I am the resurrection and life there in chapter 11. But there actually is an eighth miracle in the book of John. John chapter 21. This miracle, this miracle the draft of the fishes. Everybody remember that? Uh, was not part of the presentation of Christ to the world, but was exclusively for his disciples, and it forms a postlude to the gospel uh, record. So there is an eight, we're not going to hit on that um, in our lessons, but I wanted to kind of bring that out in, the, in this uh, afternoon's lesson, this evening's lesson, but there are actually eight. Uh, but let us get back to the theme uh, by theme here, by, by chapter in the book of John. I, I ended up taking a detour there. Uh, but I would also like to get back into there. We probably won't read all of these uh, for the sake of time tonight. Uh, but there are several of them. Because I, like I said, well, the one thing I want to point out here, the one thing I want to bring out in the book of John is that this is dripping with the deity of Christ. By the time you get done with the book of John, there should be no doubt in your mind that John is showing forth the deity of Christ, that, G that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is God manifest in the flesh. And by, hopefully by tonight, there will be no question in your mind as to that because I'm going to worry you out with this. <laughs> I'm going to worry you out with these references here. John 3, 16, he is declared to be the source of eternal life. Also in John 3, 31, he is announced uh, from above and above all. Uh, John 4, 26, Christ claims to be the promised Messiah. Uh, John 5, 25, Christ says in verse 25 that he will call the dead to life. Verse 28 through 29, he proclaims to have power over life and death. John chapter 6, verse 33, he declares himself to be the bread of God come down from heaven. And then in verse 29, Peter confessed Christ to be, uh, in fact, the very Son of God. John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39, if you want to follow along, uh, states his equality with the Holy Spirit. So not only is he trying to uh, show forth that he has his equality with God, that he is God, but he is also showing forth his equality as the Spirit of God. Uh, him and the Spirit are one. Uh, then you have 8.23, uh, states that he is from above uh, and not of this world. John 8.42, proceed uh, forth and came from God. 8.58, uh, he, takes to, he uh, takes to himself the title, I am. And so he brings forth that and states that he was before Abraham was. Which is very interesting to me myself. John 9, 37 through 38, he receives worship as the Son of God. John, John 10, 30, proclaims equality with the Father once again. Uh, 10, 36, he, re, he reiterates the claim that he is in fact the Son of God. Uh, John chapter, we'll skip through, John chapter 11, John chapter 12, John chapter 12, 41, John chapter 13, verse 13. John 14, 9, claims to Philip that he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So therefore, he's showing forth his deity again, showing forth the fact that he is, in fact, the Father manifested in the flesh, in human flesh. Uh, John 15, 5, Christ claims all power by stating that without him, uh, a man can do nothing, which is familiar with the attributes of God. 
uh, John 16, 17, he reveals himself as the one who directs uh, the movements of the Holy Spirit, which I find absolutely fascinating. John 17, 5, he claims to have uh, possessed all, uh, uh, all the glory of deity before the world was brought into, even into existence. Uh, John 18, 37, he came into the world to bear witness of truth. John 19, 30, only God could pronounce the work of redemption complete. John 20, 28, John 20, 23, and then John 21, 22 stated, states, only God may rightly command obedience. Uh, and those are all references to the Lord Jesus Christ, which shows forth that God, that Jesus is God. So these chapters, no doubt, set forth the theme of John, Christ as God, manifest in flesh. And I don't understand tonight, I don't understand how a Jehovah's Witness can read the book of John and not believe that Jesus is God. That's exactly right. They, 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 they have to not read it in order to not believe that. Yeah, they changed it. That's right. They have. But that's, that's crazy. I, if, if, you ever, if you ever dealt with Jehovah's Witness, you take them to the book of John, and they, well, they start going all over the place with that thing. Uh, but, but this theme, in my opinion, is the most interesting about John because of the frequent passages that portray the deity of Christ uh, with God. Um, so, uh, number two, I want to I want to let's look at uh, what is not found in John. So we looked at the, what the theme of John. I want to I want to look at right now what is not uh, in John. What is not found in John. So the things not found in John actually put more emphasis on the theme of Jesus being God manifest in the flesh. And remember that the book of John portrays Jesus as God. So the things that are not in the book, uh, are not in this book, actually show forth that he is, in fact, the Son of God. There is no genealogy, as we said, for Jesus is the beginning. He is the Alpha, and he is the ending. He's Omega. Uh, there is no description of his baptism, for God is not subject to man. There is no record of the temptation, for God cannot be tempted. You may know that because of James chapter 1, verse 13. He says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Uh, so there is no account of the transfiguration, uh, for the earthly kingdom is never in view in John. Uh, there is no choosing of the apostles or sending out of the 17 in this account. Uh, Jesus does not commit himself to men. Uh, so these things that are not found are pretty significant when you're looking at the theme of John. John 2, 24-25 says, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew uh, what was in man. And so he has never once seen in prayer for the Father's help in the book of John. I don't know if you ever noticed that going through the book of John, that uh, you never see him praying uh, he never, he never once seen, he's never once seen in prayer for the Father's help. He never, we never read of Jesus as the son of David for that is an earthly title uh, to an earthly throne. We do not find the word repent and so often used in the other gospels. In John, man is not viewed as guilty and needing pardon, but as dead and needing life. Um, the word forgive is never used in John. The son of man on earth forgives. Matthew 9, 6, but that ye, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. So the Son of God gives eternal life. Uh, there are no parables, as I mentioned before, in John, because nothing is concealed in the book of John. All is revealed in the book of John. And also, to the book of John never mentions devils or unclean spirits, because uh, God will bruise the head and the rest will, be, and the rest will crumble. Um, which is interesting to note, but both what is in each chapter and what's omitted from this book all are significant when reading the Gospel of John. And I want to show forth this, these things because when we go through this book, we're going to see this. And for your sake, when you read through the book of John, you can have a better understanding when you read through the book of John all these things that are happening. Um, but other facts about the Gospel of John. Only John has the soldiers falling in the garden. Only John. There was no agony in the garden. The Lord is never seen in John as praying to the Father in dependence. Only John stated that the Lord laid down his life. In John chapter 10, verse 18, it says, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So, how differently the gospel showing Jesus as God presents the events leading to the cross and the, sense in the, in the scene in the garden of, of Gethsemane. There is not a word in, the, in his record of his 
apprehensions at the cross. You don't see that at Gethsemane in the book of John. While Luke tells us of his, uh, you know, his, his prediction that, that he would be delivered to the Gentiles and mocked and spitefully entreated and spit up and spat upon, John tells us that when he knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto his Father. And he devoted himself to encouraging and praying uh, for uh, those he would leave behind. And then also in Luke, uh, we read of the prayer for the removal of the cup, you know, uh, that this cup pass from me. And the angels aid the agony of his prayer in the garden, and he drops and he sweats great, as it were, great drops of blood uh, upon his brow. And all this is fitting with Luke's theme of, of the perfect man. So you can kind of see even the way that Luke writes, it kind of caters to Jesus Christ as the man, so you can see his agony. You can see the things that he's going through. Um, and John omits all of this and tells us Jesus laying his foes upon their backs and demanding that his disciples be left alone. So it's very significant. It's very interesting to note, however, too, how many times that the number seven occurs in the book of John. You ever notice that? You ever notice that John is a book of sevens? Uh, so tonight, let me real quick, I want to go through these a little bit. There's, only, there's 14 of them. Uh, so 7 plus 7, 14. Anyway, uh, number one uh, shows that life through the Lord Jesus Christ is shown forth in seven ways, uh, which is interesting. There are seven marvelous gifts. There are seven cannot statements, which we will be going through, the cannot statements of John. There are seven incidents common to other gospels. There are seven I am statements. We'll, we'll be going through those as well. Um, seven witnesses of Christ's deity. We went through some of those. The Lord spoke to the Samaritan woman seven times. In chapter 6, we are told seven times that the Lord came down from heaven. Uh, seven times the Lord is referred to as the bread of life. The good shepherd does seven things for his sheep. Christ makes seven references to the hour of his death. He instructs the disciples to pray in his name on seven different occasions. There are seven things that the Holy Spirit is said to do for saved people. Then lastly, in John chapter 17, Jesus asked the Father for seven things and refers in the same chapter uh, to the disciples as a gift from the Father seven times in prayer. So, how about you? That's a lot of sevens. It's a lot of sevens. It's a book of sevens, uh, which is interesting, interesting to me, interesting to note. But listen, tonight I kind of want to take a, uh, I kind of give you all I can give you uh, without really just really bogging down, which we may have already done that somewhere along the line, but... I don't want to get any more bogged down than we are, but I wanted something that stuck out to me in the book of John, and I, I'm, I'm not going to get a chance to preach it, so I'm going to kind of give it here, is that uh, I want to take a moment to deal with, in my opinion, probably one of the saddest verses in John, and talk about, uh, I'm going to end on Luke, and talk about Luke some, but please turn to John chapter 6, John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Like I said, please forgive me if I've gone too fast. There's just a lot of, a lot of stuff to cover. The recording's online. You can actually, I believe there's actually a button you can slow it down even. So you guys are good to go. Um, John chapter 6. That's oftentimes what people say about me. You talk too fast. Well, you know, that's the way God made me. <laughs> John chapter 6. And here's the crazy part. John chapter 6, verse 66. John chapter 6, verse 66, 666. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And to me, that is probably one of the most saddest verses uh, in the book of John. Isn't it interesting that, the, that a verse uh, bearing the number should have to do with the disciples forsaking the Lord because uh, of a controversy over receiving his flesh and drinking of his blood for their salvation? Um, isn't it remarkable that this number 666 shows up in connection with men uh, who could not distinguish the spiritual truth of eating flesh and drinking blood and the literal word picture uh, being used? Verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the, fe the flesh profiteth nothing. And the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But as the Lord watched men turn and walk away rather than abide in his presence until he could grant them fuller understanding of his statements. Um, he turned to his disciples. And in a voice, if you can imagine tonight, tinged with sadness, but full of challenge. 
asked if they too would leave. Could you imagine that? Can you imagine Jesus? Jesus. We have never seen him. But here he turns to his disciples and he says, will you not leave? And in response came the verse that is my favorite in the book of John. Look at verse 68. You know, Simon, Peter stuck his foot in his mouth a lot. Uh, he's a lot like us. He's like me. He's, he sticks his foot in his mouth a whole lot. But sometimes Peter says some profound things. And he says, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So once one has been made a new creature by the working of God's grace, he knows that there is nothing to compare with the joy of eternal life. Nothing. So the response to those that would call us to sin, the reply to those who asked us to quit when times get tough, and the response to the devil when he seeks to lead us astray are provided right here by, the, by, by Simon Peter. To whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? There, no one in the thing is, there, there, there's no one in this, in this universe with anything to offer that can compare with what we have found in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not anything this world can offer you that would compare to being saved and being bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and serving Jesus Christ and walking with God and having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. There is nothing. There is not a thing in this world you can point to and say, this is better. This is better than serving Jesus. This is better than following Jesus. There's not a thing in this world that you can point and show me that is better than serving the Lord Jesus Christ. To whom shall you go? Let me ask you tonight. To whom will you go? Where, where, what are you going to do? Listen, if you get discouraged and you get disgruntled, where are you going to go? You're going to quit on the Lord? No, he's been too good to us. He's been too good to us. He's given us his son. God has given us his son, Jesus Christ. As I preached the other night, we, we, he's our advocate. Listen, he does everything for us. Listen, the Holy Spirit does everything for us. The Holy Spirit is the most unappreciated part of the Godhead. And he does everything for you and I. And we quench him all the time. But there's not a thing on this earth that is better and following Jesus Christ. To whom shall we go? He says. But let's look at uh, Luke chapter 17 verse 10. You ain't got to turn there. I'll, I'll, I'll read it for you. It says, So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. We are to serve the Lord because of who we are in Him. And who He is in us. And when we have done so, Christ will not be in our debt because we've done what he's asked us to do. Verse 10 of Luke 17 teaches us that if uh, we obey every commandment of the Lord, if we do his bidding every moment of every day, and if we present our bodies a living sacrifice, listen, we have simply done our duty. If my every action pleases God, he is not profited. If my every word honors his command, he has gained nothing. He has gained nothing. If my life is all that he has, uh, if my life is all that uh, he has said it should be, I have not increased the majesty of the Lord, not one iota. If my ways are found to always be center of the narrow of the road, right in the middle of the road. God is under no obligation to reward me. If my path is found to be in his steps, I have not gained spiritual, I have not gained spiritually. I've not gained any spiritual profit for that matter. I have, listen, we have simply done what is expected of us. We have done our duty. I have simply done my duty. And the redemption of our souls through the death of Christ, our cleansing through His blood, uh, our, our very existence granted by His grace and our every need provided by His loving kindness are reasons for our service because of what, he did, he, what He's done for us. Listen, I, I'm, I'm real, I don't know, I'm a real sticker on being faithful. 
So is the Lord. <laughs> Being faithful. Listen, there is not a reason for us to skip out on God. There is not a reason for us not to give God what, what, he, what His rightfully His. Our bodies are bought with a price. We're no longer ours. We're at His disposal. Our lives are just instruments for Him to use. It's what's our reasonable service. And when a man seeks to serve God so that God may give him something instead of serving God for what God has already given, and that man lacks understanding. He lacks understanding. And if that's you tonight, listen, you lack understanding. When we shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say this, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Romans 12, 1 calls this our reasonable service, our reasonable duty. Listen, uh, it's a sad thing. The reason I brought that verse out is because it's always struck me. It's always rang in my heart and mind of why in the world would the disciples, why would that even be in question? To leave the, to leave the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you kidding me? The Son of God? But yet, we, some, oftentimes we're in the same boat. God calls us to have fellowship with him when we don't pick up our Bible. We've left him. God calls us to have fellowship with him when we don't pray. We've forsaken him. God calls us to go witness to somebody and we don't. We quench the Holy Spirit and we don't. God, God is not, there's no, there's no gray area with God. There's no gray area with God. He's hot or cold, black or white. So either you're either going to serve God or you're not going to serve God. And the thing is, if you're not serving God, then you are, are the biggest, you are the biggest helper that the devil has tonight. You are the one who you are the one he's going to use because you're not where you should be spiritually. You're not, uh, you're not giving God what's his. It's your reasonable service to be here tonight. And listen, I'm not, I know who I'm talking to tonight. You guys are here. You guys are the faithful ones. I understand that. But if there ever comes a time in your life where you're Trying to, where well, you're thinking, ah, I just don't feel like it tonight. Listen, I'm sure there, there's Luke and there's other accounts of the gospel there where Jesus Christ said, Lord, if there be any other way, let this cut pass from me. Not my will, but thine be done. So he said, Lord, if there's any other way, listen, well, I don't really feel like it, Lord, but you know what? You, die, you sent your son to die for me. And it's the least I could do is get myself up and go get ready for church and go hear from, uh, go hear from you tonight. So... That's an intro to the book of John.